few weeks ago, we were doing the lesson in the junior class, and if you've been around the junior class during the time that it's going on, we might get a little bit noisy every once in a while, and uh, we might have a little bit of fun down there. But as we were working on our lesson a few weeks ago, I asked the kids, as we were talking about service, I said, what are some of the things that we can do around the church that will make a difference? So they came up with a few ideas, and then one of the ideas was, we could do the sermon. And I said, we could do what? <laughs> they said, we could do the sermon. So I said, well, that is great, and I love that. And I said, now, are you guys sure you want to do the sermon? They're, yes. Yes. I said, now when that day comes, and I said, we go to do the sermon, are you going to show up? And they said, yes. And this morning, three of them showed up. I said, did everybody remember? Or maybe they needed to remember. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to have the, I'm going to introduce the juniors because I told them I wasn't going to make them come up front, but I would want to just introduce them. So I'm going to start over here and have all of you guys stand up. They're sitting all in the front pew, so all of you stand up. When I call your names, you can just wave. We're the ones that uh, have fun in class. Are you guys ready? So Courtney, if you don't know Courtney's parents, they're Angie and Larry, and they are awesome. Courtney's awesome. And then Marilyn, and Marilyn is, what are you, about Number four of the girls in your family, they're just a whole bunch of really neat girls in her family. And her sister over here is Rachel, and they're a lot of fun to have in class. And then, um, I forget this one's name. Oh, wait a minute, I don't forget. This is Bethany. And if you don't know Bethany, her mom teaches in the cradle roll and has been doing it for a long time. And she does an amazing job down there. And then her dad is the head deacon here, and he makes sure that everything runs smoothly. She even helps him out a little bit. She gets him out of bed in the morning, I think. <laughs> and then Kenny. Kenny, I don't know if your parents are here, but Kenny is a great addition to our class. We love having him there. Ken, I'm sorry. And the other thing that you need to know is if uh, you're going to get in trouble speeding a little bit, his dad might be the one notifying you that you're going a little too fast. Danny, I don't know, where are his parents at? Were, his, were your parents here today, Danny? Yeah, your dad is here, your mom is here, and uh, we have Natasha and Velody, and their kids uh, are just awesome. And Jan, he's the, he's the youngest one there. Wave at them, Jan. Yeah, he's a great kid. You know, one of the things that I say over and over again to their parents is whenever we do some of these Bible games in class, I'm always a little bit humiliated and humbled because those guys know their Bible. It's amazing. Great kids. And then Tiana. And uh, she, is, um, she comes a long ways to be here at church, and we're always glad to have her in our class too. So we're the ones that uh, go down and make a little bit of noise. They're going to help me out with the sermon a little bit differently than you've probably seen before. Are you guys ready? I told one of them I could hand them my notes and let them do it. So anyway, that's how we got to this point. And as the time keeps ticking by and I keep going, it's getting closer and closer. My nerves are getting worse and worse. So I just want to pause and ask the Lord to bless all of us as we do this. Lord, we love you so much, and we thank you for how you watch over each one of us. We thank you for our parents that love us enough to make sure that we learn about you, that they take time to make sure that we can make it to our class, and that we have an opportunity to learn about how you love each one of us. Thank you for loving parents. And thank you for blessing us. Please help us so that the words that we say today will be inspired words by you. These things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't know how many people were here, but a few weeks ago, not a few weeks ago, a few months ago, uh, Bruce Marciano came here. How many people came to that? 
Oh, man, what an incredible sermon. The guy's up here in his fleece jacket, his jeans, and he starts talking about Jesus. He starts talking about when he did the movie of Matthew and how real Jesus became to him by doing that. And I think that as we look at some of these Bible characters, they get a little bit sanitized and we go, oh yeah, oh yeah, yeah, here's my checklist. They did this, they did this, they did this. But how real are they? If we were to put ourselves in their position and think about what we would be like if we had to do the things that they were asked to do. So I'm going to share or review those stories. There's four stories that we're going to talk about with people that made a difference. The first one I want to talk about is Noah. And this is where I need my junior's help. You know, as the Lord talked to Noah and said to Noah, Noah, I'm going to flood the earth. He, they'd never seen anything like this before. And for him to stretch his imagination and stop and think, flood the world? I haven't seen rain before. And he says, and on top of that, he said, Noah, you are going to build an ark for me. And you are going to save all these animals. Noah had to sit there and, and ask himself, how did I get into this? Have you ever been volunteered for something and stop and say, did you get the right person? Well, you can just imagine what the naysayers would say. And now my juniors are going to help with this part. Are you guys ready to go? All right. So some of the things the naysayers might say, the people standing around watching. All right, let's hear. He's lost his mind. What? Do you know what you're doing? Is that it? Is that all they would have said? What is rain? I Do think you... you're crazy. What's an ark? Do you believe in Bigfoot? Bigfoot? Now that's the person we need to get to, right? <laughs> Noah would know. Noah would know about Bigfoot. Now, we do believe in Bigfoot because my son has a size 17 foot. There is a Bigfoot around. <laughs> yes, Bigfoot uh, is real. Probably not quite what you thought, though. He had his own insecurities, too. He even asked the Lord. He said, me? You're asking me to do this? <sighs> he must have thought he had lost his mind. Well, you know, one of the things that I do is I teach at the college, and some of you know that. And at the college, we've moved into a brand new building. They gave me a bunch of money, and they said, go spend it on lab equipment. And as they gave me all this money, and I started looking at what lab equipment was available, I'm going, nothing was quite what I wanted. So I thought, well, I'll just design my own equipment. And so I started doing that, and I have spent three years designing three simple stands for my students to do lab work at. Three years. Well, I go out there with the students, and we put them together, and I go, okay, take this part, and let's change this. And then they put it back together, and they go, ah, that's still not right. Let's, let's change it again. But can you imagine what it was like for Noah as he's never seen an ark and he starts, starts going to work, I hope he had some uh, CAD program on his iPad. Somewhere that he could go and say, let me just sketch this up a little bit and kind of get my mind around it because he needed to build something that nobody had built before. And he also had to stop and think about how he's going to get the animals into the ark, how he's going to arrange them, the complications, the logistics... Incredible. Didn't stop him, though. What kind of job posting would, would the Lord put in the paper for that? What would they say? Uh, looking for an ark builder? What would the qualifications be? Something like a young man? Young man. He knew 120 years before the flood that it was going to happen. Somebody who works well with their hands. Someone with a knowledge of shipbuilding. 
What would he have said? Veterinarian, that would have been helpful. Or would it simply state someone who's willing to serve the Lord? Yeah. Well, let's look at Moses. There's an easy one. He wasn't asked to do too much. So Moses, we know how he, was, he grew up in Egypt. He fled Egypt because he'd killed somebody. He's living out in the desert, and all of a sudden he hears this voice that says, go free my people. Go to Egypt and free my people. Did he have doubts about his leadership qualities? Yeah, he did. As he uh, started looking at it, he even asked the Lord, and it says right there, are you sure you want me? I don't even speak very well. There's got to be somebody else who can do this. I'm not a good leader. I can move sheep around. I'm not a good speaker. I think my brother Aaron might be the person you're looking for. The Lord told him, no, I want you. Well, I don't think Pharaoh was very impressed with him. Even as he threw his staff down on the ground and it turned to a snake and they threw their staffs down and his staff ate the snakes. And we know these stories, but I don't think Pharaoh was shaking in his boots or his sandals. I don't think that he was too concerned. Moses and Aaron met with Pharaoh over 12 times trying to convince them to free the Lord's people. Don't you think at some point of going and asking over and over again that Moses must have been saying, I'm just not cut out for this. And as those plagues came, how were the Israelites with him? Were they very supportive? Or did they say this is just part of the learning curve? Pharaoh's heart was still hardened. As Moses started to lead the Israelites out of Egypt. It says that there were 600,000 fighting men. 600,000 men. That didn't include the women and children. That didn't include the livestock. So let's try and get our minds around this number. 600,000 men, but it was somewhere between 2.5 million and 3 million people that he was leading away from Egypt. What's the population of Spokane? Around 203,000. 203,000. So you take the entire population of Spokane as you've been out driving, going to the stores and that, and you start looking at all the people in Spokane. And you take all those people times 10 and say, let's go camping. What's that? And no, and no microphone. No batteries. Amazing. Amazing things. I mean, we stop and look at them. We just go through these stories and we read these numbers, but stop and think about it. We went to a Pathfinder event in Oshkosh, Wisconsin, and they had about, Mike, what was it, 80,000 people there? About 80,000 people. We were there for a week, and we were going, can you imagine what it was like for Moses? They didn't have porta-potties. They didn't have portable showers that they were going to. It was amazing. Going and getting the food. If you take all the people from Liberty Lake, Millwood, Spokane, Spokane Value, v- Valley, and you take the the number of people from the census, we are now hitting almost 300,000 people. That's moving 10 times the number of people from the Spokane Valley area here and moving them through the desert. It's amazing what they did. Do you think there were conflicts? As they're moving through the desert, everybody's smooth, everything's smooth, everybody's in harmony with each other, right? Yeah well, my juniors will help me out with this. Are you guys ready? So here are some of the conflicts that we can just imagine Noah had, or Moses had going on. They took my ten stakes. 
They have your tent stakes? They use all the hot water. <laughs> they took all the hot water? I think we should go be go bleh. I think we should be first in line. We should be first in line for everything. What else would they have been saying? Was that it? Yeah. Maybe they didn't like the color of the person's tent next to them. Could you get them to change their tent color? It is really not very attractive. I think they took one of my goats. Can you imagine all the conflict that was going on? Two and a half million people moving through the desert. What would Moses' job description look like? Leader with strong communication skills? Strong diplomat? Ability to think quickly on his feet? A lifeguard? Or a willing heart to serve the Lord? A willing heart to serve the Lord. Gideon. Gideon's another interesting character. Here's somebody that um, goes out. His father's got an altar to Baal. He's so brave, so brave that he does, he tears down the altar to Baal during broad daylight? Or does he do it at night? I mean, there's a brave man, right? Where was he at when he, was, uh, when he needed to thrash the wheat? Do one of my juniors have that? What was he doing when he was thrashing the wheat? They said he was a chicken because he was in the... He was doing thrashing it in the, where they would crush the grapes. He wasn't real sure of himself. He was so unsure of himself that when he asked the Lord for directions, he didn't ask just once, but he asked twice and asked the Lord for help. So here he is. He goes around to all the different clans and he says, we're going to go and free ourselves from the Midianites. Who's with me? And he starts getting all these people together. And 32,000 men come down. 32,000 men come down. And the Lord says, it's too many. It's too many people. Tell the ones that are afraid to go home. He tells the 32,000 fighting men, anyone who's afraid and nervous about this, you can leave. He turns his back and 22,000 people leave. What do you think the people were saying about that? How is he going to win? How is he going to win this battle if people keep leaving before the battle starts? He must not have much military knowledge to let this many people go. Why does it matter how we drink the water? So as he started paring down from the 10,000 to 300, he goes down and he says, watch, the Lord says, watch how they drink the water. That'll tell you. Well, I just know that if I drink my water and I don't spill it all over me that I'm doing good. But the Lord actually knows which one of those men are committed. I think Gideon, those 300 men, must have been the first special forces people. 300 people to go and free themselves from the Midianites. So as they go down charging towards the village with their trumpets blaring, the Midianites just give up. Is that a God thing? Amen. That is a God thing. So what would Gideon's job description look like? This has got to be good. Strong military background. Not chicken. Experienced leader. His brothers didn't even have confidence in him. Experienced in special forces? Or would it be humble and a willing heart to serve the Lord? Here's another great character from the Bible. I mean, you stop and think about it. We, we just kind of go through those stories and read through them. We don't stop and think about what it was really like. If you put yourself in their situation and all the things that go through your head, there's just one thing that's important. Here's David. Uh, David is the 
third, the fourth son. Now that's that's pretty good, I think, being the fourth son, because I know Ro- Robin. Where's Robin at? He's probably out making sure the kids are where they're supposed to be in that. My understanding is Robin is the fourth son in his family, three older brothers. And uh, maybe the reason Robin and I get along so well is I'm also the fourth brother too. So we're in good company. David, I mean, look at this great leader. I know what it's like to have three older brothers. I was kind of the experiment person. You know, in the medieval times, they'd, they'd grab somebody and say, go taste the king's food. If they survived, the king could eat the food. You know how that worked? Me, I was the third brother, so I had things like, well, let's put him in the clothes dryer and see if he survives. Right? Let's see how far we can drag him down the road um, while he's being drugged behind our bicycle. Or here's a good one. Let's see if we're all riding our bikes and he has the other end of the rope and we turn a different direction than him. What happens? Oh, it was fun. Loads of fun. How much confidence did David have? You know, while he was out tending the sheep, he told Saul later on, he said, I fear nothing because I know the Lord is with me. He said, I've seen a lion take off with one of my father's sheep. I went out there and I grabbed that lion and I grabbed that sheep out of its mouth. I've seen a bear take off with one of my father's sheep and I chased it down and I took that sheep away. Pretty confident. I think David walked with the Lord. He knew when he went out there and he saw all those people cowering back. And he saw Goliath standing out there taunting him. And he looks at Goliath. And he says, it's no match for the Lord. The Lord is way bigger than him. And as he goes out there and his brothers say, what are you doing? Are you just trying to show off? Are you just trying to impress everybody? Who do you think you are? But David stood strong. And as he grabbed those stones and he took his sling and he went running towards Goliath and he let that rock fly and knock Goliath to the ground, what were the people saying then about that small boy? There was no fear in him. He had that one job qualification that we're looking for. Let's see, what would his job qualifications be? Great military mind. Did he get that out there while he was uh, shepherding? Is that where he got his education? Physically fit or spiritually fit? Spiritually fit understanding and compassionate. You read about how Saul came after him time and time again. And David didn't go after Saul. Compassionate, loyal, and trusting. So I think back to the sermon of Bruce Marciano and they put out the call, the casting call, looking for somebody to play the part of Jesus. Did he read that and say, yep, I'm the right person for that? If you remember, he said, I'm not sure about this role. There are a few people not sure about that. But by him being willing to take on that role, he gained a blessing and he shares that blessing with us. In these stories, all these people answered the Lord's call. And when we go down these job descriptions... The Lord's only looking for one qualification. Do you love me? Do you love me? And he asks us to do very simple things. He says, if you love me, then love others as I have loved you. Be willing to serve. When the next time you're asked to do something, don't list out the reasons why you can't do it. Be honored because the Lord asked you to do it. What is our job description? Be loving. Be humble. Be patient. 
understanding, compassionate, helpful, meek, having a willing spirit to serve the Lord. I hope that uh, talking about these stories, maybe the next time you read through them, you don't speed read through, but you stop and think, what it would be like if I was that person? What's the Lord looking for from me? The next time you have an opportunity to help somebody, what's the Lord looking for from me? Just a willing heart. Just a willing heart. Noah couldn't have done what he did on his own. The Lord was there. Moses, there's no way. There is absolutely no way he could have done that on his own. Gideon, the battle belonged to the Lord, and the Lord won that battle. David, he couldn't have been the leader he was. He couldn't have beat Goliath if it wasn't for the Lord. When we start wondering about all of our shortcomings, we have no shortcomings. We have the Lord on our side, and he can conquer everything. Let's close our eyes for prayer. Lord, we're so grateful for how you bless us. And Lord, we just ask that as we move forward through our lives, that we just ask you to give us that willing heart, willing to do your work, to put ourselves aside and be willing to bless somebody else's life by being able to share a little bit of your greatness with them. Lord, help us throughout this week so that we can look for the good. Help us to look for how we can help and encourage others along their way. Lord, these things we ask in Jesus' name. Amen.